Well, good evening, everyone, uh, once again, and welcome. My name is Samantha Coolish Fargione. I am the Executive Director of the Western Historical Society in Western Connecticut. And I hope everyone has their uh, their cocktail or their mocktail tonight. Don't worry, mine is just water. Um, and because we're going to be diving into the history of prohibition. Uh, before we begin, just a few important reminders. Um, like I had mentioned, we will be recording this program tonight. We will be making it available on the Western Historical Society's YouTube page, as well as our Facebook page. And we will also email all of you a recording uh, by the end of this week. So keep your eyes out uh, on your email for that. Uh, we kindly ask that you keep your microphones and your cameras muted. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone is focused on our presenters this evening. And I, like I had mentioned earlier, we are going to be using the chat feature to run the question and answer session, which will take place at the end of the program. Uh, so if you're on a desktop or laptop, the chat feature is located at the bottom of your screen. If you're on an iPad or a tablet, it's located at the top right of your screen. Uh, you'll tap on the three dots and you'll click on the word chat and you'll be able to type in your question. And at the end, I will read the questions out uh, to our presenters to answer. If you'd like to help the Western Historical Society continue our programming, exhibits, um, please consider making a donation at the end of the lecture tonight. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and you can visit our website, westernhistoricalsociety.org, to donate or to become a member. Now, as a lead in to the Western Historical Society's upcoming exhibit, Weston Slept While the Nation Roared, Life in the 20s, which will open later this year, we've organized a series of virtual lectures that explore events that influenced and shaped the Roaring Twenties. Um, our first lecture of the series was on World War I. Our second lecture, which was only a few weeks ago, was on the Great Migration. And tonight's lecture, which is the third in our series, will explore the 18th Amendment, Prohibition. And uh, we have guest presenters tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Francis Cohn, and we will hopefully have Mr. Stephen McGrath with us this evening. Um, so I am going to uh, stop my screen share and Dr. Cohn is going to take over the room. Uh, but before he starts, I'd like to share a little bit of information on our presenters this evening. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Francis Cohn, Professor of History at Tunxis Community College, has taught history and geography for 30 years. From 2007 until 2019, he served as chairman of the Social Studies and History Department at Tunxis. He holds a bachelor in, bachelor's in geography and a master's in history from Central Connecticut State University and a PhD in history from the University of Connecticut. Um, Stephen McGrath recently retired from teaching at Central Connecticut State University, where he taught American history and European revolutions. He earned a master's in history at Trinity College, where his advisor was Glenn Weaver. He taught in Ridgefield, New Milford, and the West Hartford school systems, and was a district history supervisor for 23 years. He has taught at the university level for 20 years. He is co-author with Sarah Griswold of the First Congregational Church of Woodbury, Connecticut, 350 Years of Faith, Fellowship, and Service, uh, which was published in 2020. He also has written articles and book reviews for the Connecticut History Review. So without further ado, I am going to turn the talk over to Dr. Cohn, who's going to start us off tonight. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for making some time out of your schedule to be with us tonight. I'd like to also thank the Western Historical Society for sponsoring the event. So Professor McGrath and I have only done this once before. It's been a while, so we'll see how it goes. I might be a little rusty, but I have been looking through my notes and my slides, so hopefully it all comes back to me. 
And the way we have arranged this is to sort of divide it into two halves. It sort of naturally fell out that way. So what I'm going to discuss is the backstory to prohibition. So you're gonna be getting kind of bonus footage here, so to speak. Um, Professor McGrath will cover national prohibition of the 20s, which is sort of the main event. But what many people don't know is there's a long history of prohibition attempts um, in the United States that dates back at least to the early 19th century. And that's what I'm going to cover. So let's jump in. Hopefully the slides will work okay. And certainly I welcome your questions. As Samantha said, please, please use that chat function. The best part of these presentations for me is always the Q&A at the end um, with the patrons or with the audience. All right, so there we have our clever um, title for the presentation. We thought it was clever anyway. If we go back to the origins of the country, and there have been a lot of studies done on this, alcohol use was ubiquitous. And in fact, you see that nation of drunkards. This is actually a title of a chapter in a work by an historian, W.J. Rorabaugh, who in 1979 wrote The Alcoholic Republic, an American tradition, in which he illustrates this and documents it, that everybody drank, not everybody, but the vast majority drank, and they drank a lot, and they drank in all sorts of settings. And there were reasons for this. Um, one, water was often contaminated and dangerous. They didn't understand uh, the germ theory of disease yet, but they did understand that it could be dangerous to drink water. Um, two, alcohol was touted as having all sorts of medicinal and health benefits. And keep in mind the state of medicine at this time where most diseases or ailments really couldn't be treated. So alcohol was sort of the cure-all for everything. And of course that would persist, you know, even in the 20th century to some extent. It was a source of calories. If you think of a lot of alcoholic drinks, they are caloric. So this was a significant um, number of calories for a lot of these people too. And maybe first and foremost, it was a social lubricant. Um, and that really hasn't changed entirely. Um, if you've been to weddings, if you've been to birthday parties, if you've been to retirements, often you know, people drink. And certainly in the colonial area, era, into the early national period, people drank at every possible occasion. What was discouraged and controlled to some extent was public drunkenness. Uh, to get drunk in private with your comrades in arms, as you see in this painting, was pretty common. But public drunkenness was certainly frowned upon and there were various social controls. In an America where most people knew each other, where they lived in small communities, um, often you know ethnically connected and so forth. So that's the first point that people drank, and they drank an astonishing amount um, in the colonial period, certainly into the early national period. And let's illustrate that a little bit. And this is from the Rorabha, um, actually not from his book, from but from an article he did on this. So he, he did meticulous research and tried to estimate alcohol consumption per annum per American over 15 in 1810. And again, you'd have to look at the study, but it, what he came up with is incredible. One point he makes is one can't simply look at alcohol production and then divide by the number of people per year because actually a large amount of that alcohol was not consumed. It was used for industrial purposes. So one really has to separate out those two things. But here's what he came up with. And again, this is per year, per American over 15. This is how much they drank. By far, the most popular alcoholic drink at this time was cider. Distilled spirits, next, beer, and then wine. And wine would typically be more the middling to upper classes, obviously. But the working classes, the poorer, it was more cider. Distilled spirits in 1810, that probably still would have been rum 
but it was transitioning towards whiskey. That would soon become the predominant distilled spirit. So if you total all this up, this is gallons. <laughs> it's over 40 gallons per person per year. And again, this is a mean also. So there were people who drank perhaps far more than this uh, to compensate for those who didn't drink as much. So it's pretty astonishing. And then if you want to do ounces per day, uh, it, that, I just did the math, it comes out to that. It's, it's really a staggering figure one comes up with. Well, was drunkenness a problem? One would expect so. Um, was alcoholism a problem? Sure, absolutely. But it wasn't really until the early 19th century that there were systematic, widespread movements that emerged to do something about that. And much of the do something would revolve around two approaches, which we're gonna come back to repeatedly here. One was to persuade people to stop. And the second was when that didn't work, because often it didn't, was to get rid of the source of their temptation, which was the alcohol itself. So the temperance movement would really arise in the early 19th century. And it's very much connected to the second great awakening, this great religious revival that would sweep the United States roughly in this period. And without getting into that whole history, that's certainly um, an important part of the temperance movement is this religious element. So the idea of demon rum Drunkenness leads to what in the Christian sense? Sin, all sorts of sin, in that people who are drunk are giving up their free will and now are more prone to sin. And we could list the sins, but I think we probably don't have to here. So certainly many of these evangelical churches began to view uh, certainly drunkenness, but even alcohol use as um, unchristian, and sinful, or at least leading to sin. So something that had to be combated. I think connected with that was to avoid public drunkenness increasingly was viewed as being engaged in respectable behavior. It was a way of separating yourself out from the masses and kind of a striving for middling class, as I call it, respectability. Middling class people, respectable, gentlemen and ladies too perhaps were not publicly drunk that became anathema uh, certainly part of this was social control too it was one group trying to impose their will on the others and that would be a repeated theme of temperance and prohibition also the sense that certain people can't control themselves so we're going to if we can't persuade them to control themselves again we're going to get rid of the source of their problem and then a fourth aspect of the temperance movement definitely is nativism. And Professor McGrath will definitely talk about that a little bit, at least when it comes to prohibition. You've got this battle between native born Americans on the one hand, immigrant groups on the other. And in this period, the two immigrant groups that were massively discriminated against were the Irish and the Germans who were arriving in very large numbers by the 1840s. To some extent, the split also breaks down Protestant Americans versus Catholic. But in a sense, I'm saying the same thing because most of the Irish coming over were Catholic and so were many of the Germans. The Protestant churches tended to be the ones that drove this temperance movement and they'd be very much involved in prohibition. And it was the Catholic church that um, was certainly more supportive of drinking, not drunkenness, but certainly more in support of the use of alcohol. So well, this is an interesting print from Nathaniel Courier. And you probably know Courier and Ives, many, many prints. And this is a famous one that's reprinted in history textbooks, for example, The Drunkard's Progress. From, if we look on the extreme left, a glass with a friend, to the extreme right, death by suicide. And you see what's happening to this figure all in between. He's losing his health, he's losing his friends, he's losing his wealth. And then if you look under the arch of this um, bridge, 
This is important too. The temperance movement and the prohibition movement are very much connected to the role of women in American society. And I dare say it's probably the same overseas too, but certainly in America, women have a central role in both temperance and prohibition for two reasons. One, the idea of Republican motherhood emerged in early national America, where the role of mothers, among other things, was to be the, the moral guardians of the family. It was to pass on morality to their children. And part of that would be, and also to take care of their, their husbands, assuming they were married and most would be. So part of this was to steer the husband away from this destructive behavior if possible, and certainly to protect the children. So again, it's a very traditional um, view of womanhood, that a woman is meant to be a wife, a mother, and hence a nurturer, a caretaker of her family. And part of that would be, again, to try to keep the husband on the straight and narrow and to try to protect the children too. But obviously the, the darker side of that was women were in many senses and children too, the biggest victims of alcoholism. You know, think of what alcoholic husbands do, unfortunately, to uh, their families because of their addiction. Violence, obviously, um, squandering money perhaps they don't have, particularly if they're a working class man, um, losing their job, etc. So again, one cannot talk about temperance and prohibition without um, understanding the central role of women in both of those movements. So I already have introduced these ideas, moral suasion, and then we're going to look at legal suasion. But moral suasion really grew out of the Second Great Awakening, the idea of using peer pressure and using churches primarily to persuade people to, first of all, not get publicly drunk, but really pretty quickly it became to give up the use of alcohol altogether so as to avoid that temptation. So this movement would sweep the United States in the 1820s and 30s. The American Temperance Society was founded in 1826 in Boston by a group of ministers, but within 10 years, I've seen different estimates. There were five to 8,000 temperance societies at the state and local level in, in the United States. So this very, very quickly swept the country. And I'm just gonna see if I can pull up this document because we have a local example here. And actually we're gonna look at the original. It's a local temperance society. Come on, here we go. From East Avon. This is a temperance society book. It's a ledger book. It's not long, but we'll just glance at it. Don't try to figure out the cursive. Of course, in, as an historian, I'm also aware that cursive will be indecipherable probably within a generation unless people have special training. I mean, decreasingly do children even learn how to write cursive. So it's gonna become a foreign language, unfortunately. But that was the constitution. This is a record of minutes. Beautiful handwriting. Dr. Cohn, just so you know, it's not coming up on the screen for us. Uh, okay. That's okay. I <laughs> just wanted to let you know. All right. I'm going to read you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I wish, I don't know if there's anything I can do here. All right. I wish, I wish you could see it. What I'll do then is to simply read you the temperance pledge. So this is one way these societies operated was to get people to pledge not to use alcohol. So I'll simply read it to you. We whose names are heron to annexed do hereby agree that we will not use intoxicating liquors nor traffic in them as a beverage, that we will not provide them as an article of entertainment or for persons in our employment, and that in all suitable ways, we will discontinuance use throughout the community. So there are a lot of parts to that, but not only were people who signed this pledge, and I wish you could see the book because it has the list of signatures, which is extensive. Not only are they pledging not to use alcohol, 
they're really in pledging now to persuade others not to use alcohol. So it's the use of peer pressure to get people to sign these pledges and defeat the problem that way. I'm sorry you couldn't see that. Well, what's the problem with having people take pledges? Well, are they gonna be able to hold to the pledge or are they interested? And obviously we know alcoholism is, a, if not a disease, it's an addiction, whatever term wants to you, we could debate that. But at some point it really becomes immensely difficult for the person to be able to make any sort of decision in terms of controlling the addiction, maybe even impossible. So when moral suasion was proven to have its shortcomings, um, the temperance groups and others would turn to legal suasion, the law. They were simply going to try to pass laws that would reduce, restrict, eventually prohibit the manufacture, sale, and use of alcohol. The fellow you see there, Neil Bao, is an instrumental figure in this legal suasion movement. He was a native of Maine. He would actually serve as mayor of Portland, Maine in the 1850s, a member of the Maine legislature. And it, very late in his life, 1880, he would run as the presidential nominee for the Prohibition Party. You might not be aware, but there was a third party, a national party, the Prohibition Party, which in 1888 and 1892 actually got over 2% of the popular vote nationally, which is not enough to win, obviously, but, but significant. He embraced temperance for at least three reasons. One, he was a Quaker, and Quakers tend to be temperate people. Maybe more importantly, he was an abolitionist. So he linked the um, manufacture of rum, particularly, with the slave trade. Rum being made from sugar, sugar being produced by slaves. But also he was a nativist. Uh, as a native of Maine, he despised the Irish who were coming to Maine, Portland particularly, in the 1840s and 50s. And of course he wasn't alone in that. Um, fair warning, I'm Irish. I can say anything I want about the Irish. So if you're offended, don't be. So what he would do in Maine is lead this effort to pass a law to prohibit liquor. And it, it succeeded, actually. And by 1855, actually, 13 states, and you see them here, the little cups of coffee I had to add because this map isn't entirely accurate, but 13 states, all of them except Delaware, north of the Mason-Dixon line in Indian territory, I guess. Um, they had actually passed what they call a mean law, a prohibition law. And Connecticut was one of those states. Believe it or not, we were. We had prohibition um, long before the national prohibition. I stumbled on this in doing research for this presentation. It was a publication put out by a group that it's called the Maine Liquor Law Statistical Society. It was really an arm of the temperance movement. It was meant to publicize the wonderful results of the Maine Liquor Law in Connecticut in this case. And on the left-hand side, there's actually an interview with Governor Dutton, Henry Dutton, who was the governor at the time, he was a Whig. And I'll just read you a couple of his conclusions. So number 24, direct action of the Maine liquor law. Its beauty is its simplicity. And again, this is Governor Dutton responding to a, a survey essentially. When you see a nuisance, you at once remove it. That is our principle. We take the abominable thing and put it away in some safe place. So when we see an individual unable to take care of himself, we simply take care of him, no matter who he may be, and put him where he cannot hurt himself or others. So it's very paternalistic to say the least. And then he's asked about legal suasion versus moral suasion. I love this response. We have found by practice that legal suasion is better than moral suasion. The latter is quite useless except with moral men. Interesting comment. 
when men are governed merely by appetite or love of gain, and by the way, that's aimed at the liquor lobby, the people producing the liquor, that latter part, love of gain, moral suasion has no effect. Legal suasion saves breath and labor and accomplishes the object in the simplest manner possible. So just pass a law, problem solved. Now, all of you know what happened to the national prohibition and why. The problem with passing a law that prohibits a substance that many people still want is you do what? You turn people into lawbreakers. And that's precisely what happened in all of these states. Um, there was corruption. There was lack of enforcement because it was really impossible to enforce. And people simply found ways around the law. So again, 1855, sort of the, the height of this main liquor movement that took off very, very quickly. 13 of states have prohibition of some sort. By 1863, only five kept those laws. So the laws, for example, in Connecticut were only in effect a, a very few years because they simply did not work. Obviously the other part of it is you create a black market. You give people now an incentive to break the law because there's so much money to do so. And Professor McGrath, well, I'm sure mentioned that when it comes to national prohibition, the same thing would happen. I already mentioned the prohibition party. And again, you see two women here. Again, the idea of women being central to prohibition and temperance also. So the National Prohibition Party was formed in 1869, the WCTU five years later. And, and both certainly embraced temperance, or in the case of prohibition, it was literally prohibition. One of the debates that separated these two groups was what, what they called a broad gauge approach versus a narrow gauge approach. So the Prohibition Party was a narrow gauge group. The only issue they ran on, the only issue they cared about was prohibition. They focused on that like a laser beam. Uh, Francis Willard was actually the second president of the prohibition party, or actually, excuse me, the, uh, would be the WCTU. Uh, but they were more a broad gauge organization. So certainly the Women's Christian Temperance Union fought for temperance, and that was to protect families, what Willard called a home defense, families, women, children. But they also advocated for um, women's suffrage, for changes to labor laws, for child welfare. So that, again, they, they lobbied for a more extensive group of changes, whereas the Prohibition Party was focused on restricting, again, the sale and use of alcohol. And both had some successes without getting into the details. I put Carrie Nation up there because she was a member of the WCTU, maybe the most famous, in fact. And she was famous for the reason you see in the photo. In 1890, excuse me, in 1900, she began what she called her hatchetation campaign to bring about prohibition kind of on her own. She said that God had told her to literally take this upon herself to end a prohibition or bring about prohibition by going into saloons in various places with a hatchet and destroy things. And that's what she did. I mean, she would literally break the liquor bottles, hack up the bar. And she was a little tiny woman, but men were terrified. of her. Today, she probably would be diagnosed with a mental illness, treated, but um, this was a long time ago. From 1900 to 1910, she was arrested about 30 times for doing this. And actually, she was disowned by most of the um, WCTU members. A little too radical for them. But again, these two groups are still pushing the issue. And one thing they're pushing for, um, ultimately, they're pushing certainly the Prohibition Party, but both for some sort of national prohibition. But they realized they could start at the local level and the state level. And one thing they pushed for is what was called the local option. And many states would pass these laws, which allowed counties to go dry to impose prohibition, or in some cases, cities 
So where you'd have many states where some counties would be dry and some would be wet. So that was a way of working towards you know, eventually a statewide prohibition and then a national prohibition. So they had some success with the, the so-called local option. And if, if you look at the situation in 1890, you see the states in green have that local prohibition, meaning some counties would have been wet, some dry. The uh, states in blue are have total prohibition, just a few at that time, and the states in yellow have no prohibition. So it's sort of a mixed bag. So sort of the third try at a national prohibition is the Anti-Saloon League, which was more successful than any group that came before them. Now, obviously they're building on the work of the Prohibition Party and the WCTU, but nonetheless, this was a group that emerged in Ohio. Actually, it was, they were, it was founded by, I won't name the names, a lawyer turned minister, it's an interesting combination, and an attorney um, who became the organizer. And this was a group that was supremely organized. The grassroots, organization that really was built around the churches, the Protestant churches, to mobilize people, to do protests, uh, to raise money. One thing they did extensively was to, um, to publicize their efforts. You see posters here. There were um, extensive pamphlets, writings, articles, this massive coordinated effort. And what they did is they concentrated on drying up liquor in, in the United States, as they said, one district and one county at a time. They would literally support any candidate who would support prohibition, and they would oppose any candidate who would not. And they were ruthless about that. They did not care about a candidate stand on any other issue. So this is, again, that narrow gauge approach. They were well-funded. They gained a lot of support, and it worked. So by 1905, which is when they're really hitting their stride, you see now, particularly that local option is in most states in the United States. And by the time we get to the eve of the national prohibition, not only was the local option sweeping the country, now an increasing number of states, and part of this is also linked to World War I which it, we can talk more about that. In the interest of time, I won't. But on the eve of the national prohibition, most states had already actually prohibited liquor. It already was on the books. Not all states, though. Um, the national prohibition, the 18th Amendment would finish the job, so to speak. That's enough. Um, I hope you do have questions. I'll look at the chat, but I would like to stop here and turn it over to my colleague, Professor McGrath. Well, good evening. Thank you, Professor Cohen, um, for that that very uh, good, uh, able review of the uh, background of prohibition uh, and and the long history of it. Uh, now, what I'd like to focus on tonight, uh, in the decade of the nineteen twenties, especially upon why prohibition proved so difficult to enforce and ultimately why prohibition was repealed uh, in 1933. Well, number one, uh, in terms of problems, uh, there was a problem of enforcement on the federal level. Uh, the uh, federal government in the 1920s was basically Republican. And historically, uh, Republicans have been low tax people and they have been very reluctant to spend the people's money. And this was true of enforcing prohibition too. It was fine to have the law on the books, but it was only half-heartedly enforced because uh, there was so little money devoted to enforcement. Uh, 
1920, they only had 1,520 men nationwide as enforcement agents for prohibition. In 1930, that number was raised to 2,836, but that still meant one man for every 12 miles of the United States border. And much of the illegal alcohol was coming in uh, through the borders on the coastline and through the Canadian border, especially. Uh, the salaries of these men, 1920, ranged between $1,200 and, and, and $2,000. And by 1930, these had been raised to uh, between $2,300 and $2,800. Now, that wasn't a lot of money. When you consider the risks that these men were taking, that wasn't a whole lot of money. And therefore, uh, it was hard to get agents uh, who were really capable enough of enforcement. So that was the, the first problem with prohibition in the 20s. Public opinion, particularly in urban areas, began to turn against prohibition very quickly after World War I. Many Northern cities never supported it to begin with. Those cities were a real mix of Irish, Italians, Germans, Slavs, African-Americans, and most of these groups strenuously opposed, opposed prohibition. And in these places, the laws were openly violated. Post-war disillusionment with the idealism of the war also played a role in eroding support for prohibition. Uh, Americans felt after World War I that they had been had. And many Americans were disillusioned with our attempt to create democracy, make the world safe for democracy, because uh, that's really not what we did at all. And so many Americans began to think, well, you know, here we've sacrificed so much for several years, it's time to have a party. And that's what the 1920s uh, was. It was a long party. It was the roaring 20s. And so uh, this was the era of bathtub gin, speakeasies, homemade wine, homemade beer. And in fact, most of uh, the alcohol consumed at that time was beer, um, there was widespread evasion of the law on the domestic level to the point where federal authorities were totally unable to control it. Now, another factor that fed into this was the, ch was the changes in manner manners and morals that occurred during the 1920s. Americans were a whole lot more mobile in the 1920s because the automobile brought mobility to Americans that they'd never quite had before. Um, what it meant was that uh, uh, couples could now date out of the purview of their parents. Uh, they were no longer chaperoned. And of course, this led to some changes in manners and morals as well. Uh, one also had the mobility to drink. And if one wanted to drink, one could go out of town and find drink. And you could always, through your connections, find out where those places were. Uh, even if you went to a hotel, there was a code for ordering liquor. And you would call room service and say, please deliver me ginger ale and cracked ice. And what you were actually ordering was a highball, which was rye, ginger, and ice. Now, I don't know if anybody drinks a highball these days, but of my parents' and grandparents' generation, it was very, very common. Canadian club, ginger ale, and ice. Uh, I think most young people have probably never heard of it. But that was the, that was a code word. 
ginger ale and cracked ice. And of course they put the Canadian club in there. Now, another factor here is that anti-German sentiment slowly began to subside. And one of the selling points for prohibition was the assertion on the part of the, of the dries, the folks who wanted prohibition, was that um, we had to make those Germans sober up. They were very concerned with the German beer gardens that were open on Sunday afternoon of all things. And uh, even Teddy Roosevelt, now he wasn't alive in the 20s, he died in 1919, but if you follow the mindset here, um, when the Benjamin Harrison administration ended in 1893, uh, Teddy was out of a job. And so he went to New York City and was appointed police commissioner. His particular uh, obsession was closing down the beer gardens on Sunday afternoon. He didn't think it was right that the Sabbath ought to be profaned by a bunch of Germans sitting around drinking beer and singing German songs. Um, this obviously did not endear him to the German community in New York. And fortunately for Teddy Roosevelt, McKinley was elected in 1896 and he was appointed uh, under, uh, 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 under secretary of the, uh, uh, of the Navy and promptly went to Washington. Now, the 1928 election was very much a struggle between wets and dries. The wets were represented by the Democratic Party led by Al Smith the happy warrior who was an Irish Catholic from New York, the first Roman Catholic to really be nominated by a major political party. And of course the Dries uh, represented by the Republican party and, and Herbert Hoover. Uh, we can't say that the uh, wet versus dry controversy was a major factor in the election. You can say it was one factor because uh, another major factor was Al Smith's Roman Catholicism that, that caused him to lose many Southern states where anti-Catholicism ran very, very deep. Now, after Hoover was elected, uh, he really was sensitive to the fact that uh, there was widespread lawlessness over the issue of prohibition. And so he appointed a commission, commission of a total of 12 men led by George Wickersham of uh, uh, Massachusetts. And this Wickersham commission was supposed to look at the issue of prohibition and see uh, what, what the problems were and recommend some solutions. Well, uh, they met for about 11 months. And as it turned out, five of them wanted the status quo, keep prohibition. Four were for modification of some sort to allow wine, for example, lower alcohol content wine and, and lower alcohol content beer. And two were for repeal out, outright. But the point I think you should, we should note is that it was six to five for modification or repeal. And uh, the five, of course, were in the minority and they wanted to stay the way it was. Um, so there was a definitely a mixed uh, report from the Wickersham Commission. Now, there was a, <laughs> a, a satire of the Wickersham Commission and it went something like this in the New York world. Prohibition is an awful flop. We like it. It can't stop what it's meant to stop. We like it. It's left a trail of grass, draft and slime. It's filled our land with vice and crime. It don't prohibit worth a dime, but we like it. And that was uh, the confusing message that the Wickersham Commission sent to the nation. Now, I think we also have to consider the growth of organized crime during the 1920s. And there were uh, organized uh, crime outfits in many, many cities. Uh, 
that were, and they were, of course, marketing uh, illegal alcohol. The most infamous, of course, is Al Capone. He was brought by a Chicago gangster, uh, Johnny Torrio. Uh, he was brought from the Five Points Gang in New York City, and he became, in effect, Johnny Torrio's executive officer at 23. Within three years, he had 700 men working for him. What he set about to do was to eliminate the other gangs that provided the competition. So Dion O'Banion was killed in his floral shop. There was a war between the O'Banion gang and Capone in 1928 and 1929. And finally, on February 17th, 1929, St. Valentine's Day, uh, Al Capone's henchmen uh, massacred seven key O'Banion leaders in a garage in Chicago. This was known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. In those two years, 1928 and 1929, there were over 500 gang-related murders in Chicago. And this scene was replicated in many other major cities like New York City, San Francisco, Detroit, Philadelphia, wherever there were large numbers of people who wanted booze. Now, it has to be remembered too that these, um, these gangsters were notorious and they were admired at the same time. At 32, Al Capone was the unchallenged master of the distribution of illegal liquor in the United States. For his sister's wedding, his subordinates put together a 17 foot tall wedding cake. Al Capone also had a huge estate in Miami. And for the first time in the American vocabulary, the term racket became used for organized crime. This was a great matter of concern for the federal government and for state and local governments. So if you look at all the reasons why prohibition was not terribly effective and why public support was eroding it, perhaps we should not ask why was it repealed, we should ask the question, why did it last as long as it did? And I think there are a number of reasons for it. Number one, prohibition was supported by a large majority of what we call low church Protestants. These were the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Disciples of Christ, all the denominations, incidentally, that used grape juice in communion. That had started, grape juice, by the way, was invented by a fellow named Welch in the 1830s, specifically for the Methodist Church. Grape juice didn't really exist before then. And no, contrary to what the fundamentalists teach, uh, Jesus did not use grape juice at the Last Supper. There was no way to preserve it. But this fellow Welch found a way to preserve it. It caught on with the Methodists and pretty soon all the low church Protestants were using it in their communion services. Episcopalians and Lutherans, of course, were never swept away with that impulse. Um, and these were two major uh, Protestant groups that opposed prohibition to begin with. Uh, Episcopalians often call the eighth sacrament gin and tonic. Now, the, the other uh, factor here, the why it lasted so long was, it was viewed as an anti-immigrant measure. And prohibition um, was viewed as a slap against the Irish and Germans. And in the early 1920s, there was a very strong nativist, anti-foreign sentiment, again, rising in the United States, and again, primarily among low church Protestants, okay? Um, it was viewed largely as an anti-immigrant measure. 
Lots of politicians, especially Republicans, referred to beer and Bolshevism, conjoining the two. And this is the era in which the United States passed highly restrictive immigration laws. And the immigration laws were designed to keep to a minimum uh, Eastern Europeans, Southern Europeans, and shut the door entirely on Asians. Uh, for example, if you look at the, the, the National Origins Quota Act of 1924, which really was the culminating law in this, uh, uh, this series of laws on immigration, and it was not really repealed overhaul until 1965. That's within our, within our lifetimes. What it did was it specified that there'd be about 150,000 immigrants let in every year. And that any group would be restricted to its percentage of the American population in 1890. So 2% of that 150,000 that would be let in in the future could be Italian because Italians only comprised 2% of the American population in 1890. This was definitely calculated to keep out the Italians, uh, the Greeks, the Poles, the Russians, the Ukrainians, uh, all those groups from Eastern Europe, many of whose uh, people arrived uh, without a reading knowledge of their own language. And, and that was, uh, and, and American social workers try to turn all of this around by sponsoring schools, but uh, by also trying to change people's living habits, uh, trying to get the Italians away from Italian food, for example. And we know how well that worked out, don't we? Uh, at any rate, um, the, the Catholics by and large were in favor of repeal of prohibition. They were mostly Irish, German and Slavic and Italian. They were opposed to prohibition. And uh, Chesterton once said, and, and I think there's some truth to this, um, wherever the Catholic sun doth shine, there's lots of laughter and good red wine. At least I've always heard it so, benedicamus domino. And that really summed up the Catholic attitude on, on prohibition very well. Um, I think the last factor that we have to contend with is that middle-class women supported prohibition by and large, even if they were Irish Catholic, even if they were German Lutherans. And a lot of it hinged on the issue of spousal abuse and family abuse from men who were alcoholics. Men who would go to the bar on uh, Friday afternoon and drink up the whole paycheck and leave the family in privation for the entire next week. Uh, this was a really major problem in American history, alcoholism. America from the early days of its inception was literally awash in alcohol. And this of course included Puritan New England as well. Okay. Um, in 1777, at yeah, the Battle of Ridgefield where the uh, American army and militia faced the British invading army, Colonel Philip Burr Bradley, commander of the 5th Connecticut Regiment, submitted a bill to the state of Connecticut. And that bill was a liquor bill for the rum that the soldiers consumed. And, it's, and, and if we look at that liquor bill and how much rum that was, each soldier would have to have consumed a quart of rum in anticipation of the Battle of Ridgefield. Well, maybe that's what gave them the courage to go into the battle and fight with, 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 with wild abandon because they did push the British back. But certainly, uh, rum, uh, use of rum was not viewed uh, 
as any kind of social pathology in the colonial and early national American history until you get to about 1800, and then it starts becoming more problematic. So how does it get repealed? Now, the victory of FDR in the 1932 election was indicative of something. It was indicative that the voters were fed up with the economy, obviously. But it was also indicative of the fact that voters were fed up with prohibition. Walter Lippmann, and, and some of you remember Walter Lippmann, uh, wrote that uh, the country is going down the drain economically and all the political parties can talk about is booze. Booze was a major issue in 1932 in the election. Of course, FDR won by rather a landslide. The rural Protestant areas of, of the North and the Midwest voted by and large for Hoover, but the cities and the areas with large numbers of, of Catholics, uh, uh, Jews, uh, Eastern Europeans, uh, uh, German Lutherans, uh, they voted by and large for FDR. And FDR obviously won the election, but he was a wet. He was campaigning enthusiastically for the repeal of prohibition. Well, the Congress drafted a constitutional amendment. It sailed through the two houses of Congress two thirds in each house, and then it was sent out to the states for ratification. Now, you might think that the low church Protestants would have mobilized in 1933 to fight the repeal of prohibition on the state level, but they were so connected with the Republican party and the Republican party was so thoroughly discredited that where they organized, they were terribly ineffective. So that the constitutional amendment was ratified by the requisite three fourths of the states. And many in those states liked the idea of the compromise, dry towns or dry counties. They no longer wanted a federal law, but they thought that if you gave local counties, especially in the South and in the Midwest, county governments, and towns in New England, the option to go dry, that this would satisfy the desires of many of the uh, especially rural low church uh, Protestants. So that by um, early 19, uh, end of 1933, uh, prohibition had been repealed. I think it's important to note the history of it and the way in which surrounding issues and changing attitudes affected uh, the, 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 the legislation of prohibition and then the repeal of prohibition. Uh, it's important, I think, to note that um, there were certain groups that stayed with it all along. And they were very well organized, but it wasn't until the wipeout of the Republicans in 1932 that the pro-prohibition uh, elements um, lost their influence and were vote basically voted out of office. Okay, I think we can probably open it to questions for uh, Professor Cohen and, and myself. So. Uh, Sounds wonderful. Thank if, you. If, if you would feel the questions, um, that would will. be really good. Oh, oh, one more comment. Is Wilton's still dry? I don't believe Wilton is dry anymore. And okay. maybe, yeah, I don't think they are. I don't think uh, that town is anymore, but if someone what? knows, I'll yeah. that, uh, in case I'm excited. Yeah, we, when we were living in Ridgefield in the 1970s, uh, there were no good restaurants you could go to in Wilton, nor were there any inns or hotels uh, because nobody could serve liquor. Hmm. Now that may have changed. 
I believe, I believe it has. Uh, mm -hmm. But like I said, maybe someone who is a will tonight or, or a local uh, can let us know in the chat. Yeah, yeah, please. We do have some questions, so I will. Okay. So the first one is from John. He's actually tuning in from London, England. Uh, so John, thank you so much for joining us. And he asks, did gin become popular in early America as it was in London, England? N not really. You know, you're thinking of Hogarth and Gin Lane and all of that and the satirizing. No, gin wasn't really a major factor. It was rum. And it was because rum was so easily available. It was made from uh, molasses, uh, which was brought in from Barbados. And New England had a very vigorous trade with uh, the British Isles, the, not the British Isles, excuse me, the islands in the uh, uh, Caribbean. And so uh, rum was really, and, and cider, rum and cider were the two drinks of choice. Now, Jefferson himself, loved his French wines. Mm -hmm. And Jefferson went into serious debt on a number of issues. But French wines was one thing that broke Jefferson's bank. And when he died, he was insolvent and his, everything was sold off to wow. pay his debts. Oh my goodness. Um, Jen asks, I understand drinking alcohol began because water was unsafe. But how did it go from being acceptable, being acceptable to drink watered down alcohol to a means of escape and addiction? So how, you know, how mm -hmm. did we get mm -hmm. from, from A to B, really? Professor Cohen, can you take that one? Well, I mean, part of it would have been the sanitation movement in the 19th century, that the realization that clean drinking water was necessary. And particularly that would have been happening in urban areas first, you know, the yes. laying of water pipes to uh, places like New York City. Mm -hmm. So that would have been probably the middle of the 19th century and you know, um, that yep. water supplies became safer. That'd be part mm -hmm. of the answer, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a good answer. So in order to, to make sure that everybody has safe water, they laid these, um, these lead water pipes, which probably diminished people's IQ in the urban areas. But uh, they didn't know that at the time. Right. You know, history, the thing that's so fun about history is that it's <laughs> just full of unintended consequences. Yeah. And it is stranger than fiction. It certainly is. Uh, let's see, our next question. Did the blue laws prohibiting alcohol sales on Sunday have anything to do with prohibition? I think they did. Um, the blue laws were basically to enforce observance of the Sabbath in New England so that people did not do servile work. And at the time that the New England states started legislating prohibition, one of the holdovers from it after the repeal, I believe, was uh, the Sunday prohibition on, on, on selling alcohol. Mm -hmm. Am I right on that, Professor uh, uh, Cohen? Yeah, I mean, uh, in Connecticut, I think a lot of it was the, which is still a powerful force, although it's waning, yeah. it's it's the liquor lobby, it's the, the yes. package stores, it's right. the small mom and pop package stores who that's didn't right. want to be open seven days a week. That's right. So that, that's certainly a big part of it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. you know, it was only recently where those laws were changed in Connecticut, where that's alcohol right. can be sold on Sundays. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. Um, can either of you speak on any um, sort of gangster activity happening in Connecticut? I mean, I, we know Al Capone in, um, in Chicago, and I'm sure there was a lot of uh, gangster activity mm -hmm. happening in New York City. Um, but what about in Connecticut itself? I, I'm not sure about the names of the uh gang leaders, but I do know there were gangs operating in New Haven and Hartford, chiefly in the Italian-American, Irish, and Jewish communities. At one time, there, was re there really was a Jewish mafia, mm -hmm. and there was an Irish mafia, and there was an Italian mafia, and the one that really survived is the Italian mafia. Uh, but even today, you have the Russian mafia, the Albanian mafia, the Chinese mafia,
in major cities, especially New York, uh, because they tend to flourish among immigrant groups. Uh, they provide protection for immigrant groups, and on the other hand, extortion as well. Uh, yes, there was mob activity around here. There definitely was. Interesting. Well, um, uh, if there's any other questions, um, pop it in the chat. Um, I don't see any more <coughs> popping up, um, but um, is there anything else that you two gentlemen would would like to add about prohibition? And, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, Dr. Cohn, you know, early on, they, they had prohibition and it didn't work. So, you know, now we get into the 20s and we're thinking that prohibition is going to work where once again, history is repeating itself. If it mm -hmm. didn't work back in the 1800s, it's not gonna yep. work a hundred years yep. later. So. Mm -hmm. And of course, yeah, of one, course. Can, one can argue, and Steve will probably talk a little more about this. One can argue that it did work to an extent. Yeah. If the goal was to reduce alcohol consumption, there is a lot of evidence now that it did achieve that goal, at least. It certainly did. Yeah. yeah. It was harder and harder to get the alcohol unless you had connections. Your rabbi could write you a note to get alcohol for sacramental purposes. Um, but by, and, and if you had alcohol before prohibition, you could drink it. There wasn't a ban on drinking it. There was a battle on the ban on the manufacture and sale of it. So there were some people, uh, not exactly uh, the poor people, but pretty well off people who just bought literally tons of alcohol in anticipation of prohibition, and they had they were well supplied uh, during the the 1920s. So uh, yeah, it, it was it, well, you know, Tip O'Neill. Remember Tip O'Neill in the 1920s. Tip O'Neill, who was a poor Irish kid from Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, was working for a catering company, and they had to cater. Uh, the Harvard commencement one year. And he was one of the boys who was there serving the food to all those people assembled. And the alcohol flowed freely. And that was the first time Tip O'Neill realized that there was a class of people in the United States of America to whom the laws simply did not apply. Um, actually, uh, we have a question here from Jen, and she asks, is it true that alcohol was served in the White House throughout Prohibition? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, the, let's see. Um, hmm. Harding was a Methodist. Calvin Coolidge was a Congregationalist. Hoover was a Quaker. And all of those groups were opposed to uh, uh, drinking. And if that had been the case and it had ever gotten out, uh, the president would have been ruined and, and perhaps dumped by his own party. So no, uh, I don't think so. But then again, <laughs> yeah. I have heard there were rumors of Harding um, philandering, liking oh, cigars yeah. and cards and, and yep. drinking. But yeah, it yep. would have been hush hush. Certainly it, it sure. wouldn't have been openly served in the White House. That would have mm -hmm. been, I think, inconceivable. Yep. Well, um, I'm just gonna check our chat and one more time. I don't see any new questions popping up. So uh, Dr. Cohn, Professor McGrath, thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge and your time this evening. Well, this has been a lot of fun, I'll tell yes. you. It, it, it's always fun to do this. Absolutely. I did one on the, the, the book, The Color of the Law, last night at the uh, Avon Public Library, and we had 60 people. Wonderful. 60 people on Zoom, something like 80 signed up. We had 60 people on Zoom. Yep. And uh, I, I think, you know, when I led the discussion last time in person two years ago, we had about 12. But right. that's a hot topic. Mm -hmm. You see, the color, something like cover, color of law is a very hot topic right now. Yes. 
Definitely, definitely. And, you know, honestly, that's also the beauty of, of these online lectures is that we can pull people in from all over, you know, like right. we had John from, from London, England tuning mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm taking a course with Professor, I'm actually taking a course with Professor Amy Pazorski of the Central Connecticut uh, English Department. And she is the editor of the Roth Journal, the Journal of Philip Roth Studies. And she has brought in experts from all over the world who have studied and written on Philip Roth to be a part of that seminar, all by Zoom. And the students, uh, I'm, I'm just taking it as an audit uh, because the last English course I had was in 1968. But those students who are English majors, senior English majors, are getting this marvelous exposure to people who have written extensively on Philip Roth. And, um, you know, Zoom is very good in that sense. It really is. I mean, the power of technology. <coughs> um, Jen asked, uh, would you, do you have any book recommendations? And I'm not sure if she means specifically yes. about prohibition, but I, let's yes. stick to prohibition. So what are some good books about Brand, do, you, do you have anything in mind? I have a few. Well, I could type in the Rohrabach book that I referenced. I think that's a good one. I'll type yeah. that into the chat. It's okay. it's a few years old, but it's a very comprehensive study. Mm -hmm. You know, Frederick Lewis Allen. Yeah, that's a good only one. Yesterday. That's a, a wonderful one. Yeah, it's a popular history of the era written in 1931. And it's a very entertaining read. And most of it still holds up. There are a couple of things I want to add to it. Um, William Luchtenberg, Leuchtenberg, actually, L-E-U-C-H-T-E-N-B-U-R-G, William Leuchtenberg, The Perils of Prosperity, 1958. Um, and uh, Oscar Handlin, H-A-N-D-L-I-N, Al Smith and His America. That's 1958 as well. And there's another really interesting one here. Uh, David Berner, B-U-R-N-E-R. -E it's entitled The Politics of Provincialism. The Politics of Provincialism. And that's 1968. Uh, yeah, um, you know, the parallels between the 20s and the 90s, and then the, um, the whole issue that we have now, rural versus urban, uh, in, ter in terms of the party affiliations today and the, the, the rural support for Donald Trump, for example, it's really not much different. Hmm. The evangelical Protestants, of course, today are not who the evangelical Protestants were then. Mostly today, they are Southern Baptist, Pentecostals, and all a garden variety of uh, little sects here and there. But, um, and, and your mainline religions today, like Presbyterian, Congregational, and, and uh, 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 Northern Baptist, are, are basically pretty liberal. But the Methodist Church is splitting up, just like it did on the eve of the Civil War. This is a fascinating phenomenon, the fracturing of American religion over Another, another lecture topic that sounds, oh, yeah. that sounds a like a good one. We mm -hmm. actually have one more question and we'll, we'll finish out with this one. Um, is there any correlation between rehabilitation centers and the prohibition era? No, I, I don't know if there is any. I, I really couldn't I don't have a yeah. decent answer for that. Fran, do you have an answer for that? I, I, that's a hard one. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I have yeah. enough knowledge to answer that intelligibly, honestly. No, I certainly don't. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. And uh, we've learned a lot about prohibition. And, you know, we were, we've been doing these lectures to kind mm -hmm. of hear 
the audience up for our 1920s exhibit and mm -hmm. you know, learning about these different events and how they influenced the 20s um, has yeah. been, been incredible. So thank you, yeah. both. thank you both so much. Thank and you. Welcome. And thank yes. you, everybody. And thank you, everyone. Fun. Yes. Take care. Thanks Good night. for joining us. And um, if you enjoyed tonight, presentation, everyone, please consider supporting the Western Historical Society with a donation or a membership. Uh, you can visit our website, westernhistoricalsociety.org. Uh, for those that are local to Western Connecticut or the surrounding area, uh, please visit the Western Historical Society. Our site is called the Coley Homestead. We're located at 104 Western Road. And you can take a self-guided tour through the property. Our buildings are closed at the moment. Um, however, we do have historic interpretive signs throughout the property. Uh, so the weather is getting nicer. So bring the family, uh, walk the grounds, learn about the homestead and the Coley family who lived and worked there, and then have a picnic. So it's a great place to enjoy a nice uh, spring weekend. Yep. You and guys do really good work there. Keep it oh, up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. And thank you. Uh, the next lecture that we have coming up in our 1920 series is The Work Must Be Done The Women of Color and the Right to Vote. Uh, that is with guest presenters um, Professor Brittany Yancey of Goodwin Co University and Karen Lyne Miller, research historian from the Connecticut Historical Society. So that virtual lecture is gonna take place on Monday, March 22nd at 6.30. And we will be co-hosting that lecture with the League of Women Voters of Weston and the Weston Public Library. So you can visit our website, uh, westernhistoricalsociety.org for the registration link. Um, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook and on Instagram to stay up to date with all of our programming. So with that, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Cohn and Professor McGrath, um, and take care. <laughs>